Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church. We are so glad you are here. We are glad that you have come, perhaps from a week that has been full of challenge, perhaps from a week that has been full of joy. Each one of us knows in our heart that we have come from a place that is different than everyone else in this room. Maybe today you don't want to be here. Maybe today all you want to do is be here. Each one of us needs to choose and make a choice to come here, and I am so thankful that you have. You are here today to worship with God's people, to experience something new, perhaps, in what the Lord is doing in our midst. And so as we stand and sing together, we are going to sing a song of invitation, a song inviting the poor and the needy, the sinners amongst us, hint, that's all of us, to come and worship the Lord. So let's stand and sing together. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. come to Jesus this morning. We long to be in his arms, held safe and secure. Lord, if there are those here today who are tarrying, who are waiting to come until they're at a place where they're better, Lord, 
we know that isn't going to happen. We know that we'll never come if we are waiting for perfection. So Lord, we come to you imperfectly. We come to you knowing that you can make us perfect. That one day we will stand with you in glory forever and ever. Amen. You guys can have a seat. This morning, we are happy to be celebrating baptism, but not just any baptism, four baptisms. <laughs> Amen, right? Amen. Amen. That's exciting. That's very exciting. So as we prepare ourselves to watch these baptisms, to hear the stories and the testimonies of these individuals in their life, we're going to watch a video. But this video, there's some interaction we need from it. We need you to sing. It's a song you'll all know. So we want you to sing along with it. Lift up your voice and let's welcome these brothers and sisters in the Lord as they come and share their story. Good morning. We as a church have been given the privilege and the responsibility to baptize believers of Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And baptism is a way that a believer is able to publicly show that they have repented of their sin, have put their faith in Jesus Christ, and that the church affirms them in their faith. In the act of baptism, we see the old self, the believer, that sinful self, uh, die with Christ, being buried with Jesus as they go underneath the water. But just as Jesus was raised to life, as the believer comes up out of the water, we see them being raised to live a new life for Christ. And this morning, Joanne Proctor, Jonathan Edwards, Paris Stu, Rasa E, and Sarah Ross are being baptized, and they have completed the baptism course with Mike Beadle. I've had the opportunity just to meet with them and hear about their faith, and I would just like you to encourage them as they come now to give their testimonies. First, going to hear from Joanne. Good morning. I grew up in a very loving Christian home. We attended church and Sunday school, 
sang in the church children's choir, accepted Christ as my savior at a very young age. When I was 12, I rebelled and didn't want to go to church. My mom said I had to go. So I went with my friend to her church. I attended church and Sunday school with her in the morning and the other, my other friends attended the Christian Baptist Church and they had Sunday school in the afternoon. So I went with them too. Fast forward, I met my husband at 15 <clears throat> and we were married for 63 years at the Christian Baptist Church and we were blessed with three children and we all went to church as a family. <clears throat> When I was 25, tragedy struck. My in-laws and my nephew passed away suddenly. Then I got lost in the way of the Lord and stopped going to church. I suffered with panic attacks and anxiety, and I would pray to God to help me through this. God's hands have always been present in my life. Even though I have everything, something was missing in my life. I was missing church. After being away from the church for about 30 years, my grandson John was led to Victory Baptist. John and his mom both got baptized, and his friend Aaron has also come to church and be saved. When I saw what Jesus was doing in my grandson's life, I knew I needed to go back to church. My friend Barb encouraged me to go and I have now been attending Victory for three years. I have repented my sins and accepted Christ as my Savior. My heart is full and the anger I struggled with started to vanish. I found myself full of much joy and peace and happiness. I now have a church family and have made many wonderful friends. I want to be baptized today as a believer in Christ, obedience to his command, as he is my Lord and Savior. And Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Wonderful. Jonathan. Thank you. I think so. Okay. Good morning. I attended church from a young age where I was taught about, thank you, about God, Jesus, and their plan for salvation. Although God loves mankind, he's also just, and sin must be punished. Unfortunately, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Fortunately, God provided a means for salvation consistent with his character. He sent his son Jesus who lived as both a man and God, and he lived a perfect life, he died for the world's sins, he was buried and he was raised to life on the third day. Now, if you confess your sins, or sorry, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that Jesus raised, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. I remember accepting Jesus into my heart when I was about six years old. Although I can't remember the exact date, or age, I do remember the setting, as I was on vacation and I was in a hotel room with my younger brother and my mother. Since then, um, growing up, I've been very fortunate to have great Christian role models and examples in my life in the form of my parents and my grandparents. As I confront the challenges of life, a verse that I've turned to for strength is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. By the grace of God, I have remained a Christian all these years. But recently, as the topic of baptism has come up, I have felt a stirring inside of me. Attending Victory, pa Victory Baptist Church as I have for the past few years, this topic comes up quite a bit. Um, <laughs> then, at the start of this year, I started a new devotional focused on the Gospels. Uh, and although I had read the recountings of John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism many times before, it took on a new significance for me this time, 
and I was driven to be baptized in obedience with Jesus' command. I'm excited to be baptized here today and continue growing in my relationship with Jesus. Thank you. We're going to hear from Paris soon now. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor to be here with you um, and share my story. Thank you for listening. And Pastor Jason, uh, I truly appreciate your support and guidance. Thank you so much. Uh, my faith journey started when I was 13. It was a time when I was really curious and searching for something deeper. Even though I wasn't officially allowed to attend church, I felt this strong pull towards it and decided to go secretly, driven by an inner call that I couldn't ignore. Everything changed when a close friend gave me a Bible. This simple yet powerful gift burned a flame within me. The Bible became more than just a book. It was my guide and a source of comfort. Like Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's exactly how I felt. It lit up my way and gave me the wisdom I was looking for. As I read more, Jesus' teachings really spoke to me. His words were like a breath of fresh air, offering love, hope, and direction. The stories of sacrifice and redemption felt so real and alive. John 8, verse 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That light was what I found in Jesus. Even though I was like, uh, I was kind of sneaking into church, I felt like I belonged. The worship the sermons and the community were all amazing. I started to really understand what Jesus did for us and felt God's love deeply. Romans 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One night I'd had a life-changing event. Woke up suddenly, and I saw a woman in white standing by my bed. I was scared at first, but when I went to her, because she was holding her hands toward me, I reached out to her, and the peace I felt was incredible, like a huge weight had been lifted. I knew it was a sign. I decided to give my heart to Jesus, the peace I felt is described in Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. When I was 28 years old, I traveled to the city of Urmia with a group of Christian friends. Urmia is a city in the northwest of Iran. We visited the old churches in Urmia, and it was so inspiring and beautiful for me. I was as if I was walking on clouds. Every day I became more sure about the path I was choosing. The experience deepened my faith and strengthened my resolve. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6 was constantly on my mind, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Since then, Jesus has been the foundation of my life. My, that initial spark from my friend's gift has grown into a strong, unwavering faith. Through all these ups and downs, I have felt his presence and love guiding me. 
Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, do not, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Looking back, I'm so grateful for the journey that led me to Jesus. I pray for strength and guidance as I continue forward, trusting in God's plan. I hope my story encourages others to seek out and uh, embrace the amazing love and guidance that comes from knowing Jesus. I pray that everyone who hears this feels the same transformative power of his love that I have. Thank you for your time and attention. I wish you all the best, Harstu. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we're going to hear from Sarah. Good morning. First Peter three three to four. Your beauty should not should not come from outward adornment and as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self and unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is great worth in God's sight. Ever look back at yourself and say, wow, I'm a good person? And our beauty isn't about looks or what we wear. It's what's inside that makes the beauty within. I've struggled with this my whole life. When I was three, my dad abandoned me. During my early teens, my mom followed the Christian way. Once I was 14, she passed away. I then wondered if God loved me, why would he do that to me? I started struggling with addictions, anxiety, and depression. One day, my medication wasn't working. I thought to myself, if God heals, maybe he can help me. I then leaned over to him and asked him to forgive me of my sins. I immediately saw a dark, dark shadow and my anxiety was healed. I have not, I have put my faith in Jesus and I believe he died for me and rose again. Since I put my faith in Jesus, I've gained Christian friends, connected with ch my children, stayed away from toxic environments, and gained a new part-time job so that I'm no longer struggling. Amen. Just thank you for sharing your testimonies with us. They truly just encourage us in our faith. Before these four are baptized, we're just going to lift them up together in prayer. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of Joanne, Jonathan, Peristu, and Sarah. And we are encouraged to hear that the gospel is powerfully at work in their life. By your grace, they have repented and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. In an act of obedience, they desire to be baptized. And today, they are buried with Christ through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, they too may live a new life. May you guide them by your spirit and help them to walk faithfully in your ways until Christ returns. May each one of us be reminded of our commitment to Christ through the act of baptism, that we have died to sin, have been washed clean, and should no longer let sin reign in our mortal bodies, but live for righteousness. We praise you, God, for your, the wondrous gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come on up.
Joanne, are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I am. Will you turn away from any known sin in your life, asking God to forgive you your sin? I will. Do you desire to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life that you may live a life that is pleasing to God in every way? I will. Okay, I'm gonna cross your hands. Okay. Upon profession of your faith, and in accordance with the Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Will you turn away from any known sin in your life, asking God to forgive you your sin? Yes. Do you desire to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life that you may live a life that is pleasing to God in every way? Yes. Upon profession of your faith and in accordance with the Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Parisu, are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Will you turn away from any known sin in your life, asking God to forgive you your sin? Yes. Do you desire to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life, that you may live a life that is pleasing to God in every way? Yes. Upon profession of your faith and in accordance with the Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sarah, are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Will you turn away from any known sin in your life, asking God to forgive you your sin? Yes. Do you desire to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life, that you may live a life that is pleasing to God in every way? Yes. Upon profession of your faith, and in accordance with the Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's amazing. Woo! What, what I love most about this baptism today is I'm sitting there smiling the whole time, as I hope you all are, is so many people just got baptized. So Amen. many. And, and I, it just it gets me excited about what the future could be for our world, for what the Lord can do in the nations. He works here, but he's going to work outside of here in not just Newmarket or Bradford or East Gwillimbury. No, he's going to, to Toronto. He's going to Manitoba. He's going all the way to British Columbia. You know, he, take it even further. Uganda, all the way across to Japan. He's, over, he's everywhere. Amen. Sorry, I'm way too excited. But am I too excited? I don't think so. Let's stand and praise the Lord. Let's ask him to make the whole world praise him
And you're allowed to clap if you want. That's great. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light. seated. Well, like Scott, I'm just very encouraged this morning. I want to ask the question, though, for all of us, is what rules your life? What rules your heart? What do you find yourself thinking about? What's your if only? If only I had this, everything would be okay. It's usually a good indicator of what rules us. And what these four individuals that were just baptized are saying today and being baptized is they're saying that Jesus is the Lord of their life. 
It means he's the one that rules their heart. He's the one that is going to rule their life. But even if we've been a Christian for many years, there's other things that can creep in and begin to rule us. And it's something that we, uh, it's, it's, it's really as old as the human story. We want to rule ourselves. The sad thing is, though, is when we try to rule ourselves, often things rule us and we lose control. In Psalm 2, the psalmist asks this question Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up. And the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And this is the Lord's response. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Imagine looking at it from God's perspective, our, the way we like to rule ourselves. You see, oftentimes we don't have that per, the right perspective. Who are we to rule ourselves, right? Well, in, in, uh, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells us that we are to pray regularly, that uh, his kingdom would come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in just a moment, we're going to pray that prayer. But it's a prayer for all of us, too. We're going to pray for the needs of our world, but it's a prayer for your life. And it's this prayer to say, Lord, break down my kingdom. Help me not to be the ruler of my heart, but may you rule my, rule my life and lead me to where I want to go. I want to see your kingdom's power at work in my heart and in my life. And I want to see that kingdom power at work in, in our world and in the lives of other people. And um, so we're going to pray for those needs today. And there's great many needs in the world. We know that. And um, we're also going to spend a little bit of time, uh, we got a message this week from um, another fellow pastor uh, in, our, in our denomination, in the fellowship, and um, he's a church planter uh, down in sort of the Chatham area, and their son, uh, I believe he's uh, five or six years old, is, is uh, in hospice, uh, he has a brain tumor, incurable brain tumor, and we're just going to lift Dan and Jill Johnson and Luke uh, up in prayer, um, and just as they expect his passing any time, we just ask the Lord's peace be upon them, and uh, that they would be comforted by the hope of the resurrection. And so we're going to lift them up in prayer as well. So let's just bow our heads and pray at this time, and bring these needs before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you that you hear us, that you have commanded us to pray and lift our needs up to you, and you have promised us, Lord, that you will answer when we call out to you. And today, Lord, we ask that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want to see your power at work, and we've seen glimpses of it today in the lives, these lives that were changed and as they stepped out in obedience to your command to be baptized, Lord, may you continue to watch over them and guide them in their Christian life. May they stand before you, Lord, uh, faultless. May they live pure and holy lives in, in, in your sight through your Spirit's power. And we ask, Lord, that as we look into our world, we see many conflicts that are raging we see war in Ukraine, in Israel, in Palestine. We see a civil war has broken out again in Sudan, in Haiti, in many other places. And we know the cause of this, Lord. It's We are trying to break those chains. We are trying to uh, rule ourselves. And in these conflicts, Lord, may you bring peace. May they uh, bend their knee, Lord, and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. May you bring healing to those nations and peace. Lord, uh, we also think of our own nation. And uh, we are commanded in your word to lift up prayers to those who are in authority. Or to pray for those who are in authority, Lord. And today we want to lift up our rulers, those who rule over us. 
And we ask, Lord, that they would acknowledge you as well. We, we, we lift up Justin Trudeau to you and, and, and Doug Ford and our local MP, Virginia Haxon. And you know that there are many others, Lord, who uh, have responsibility in this nation to rule and guide. And we ask, Lord, that uh, they would maintain peace and order, that we can continue to worship in peace and serve you. And Lord, we lift up our churches in Canada. We thank you for the good things you are doing among Fellowship Baptists and, and in others, Lord, we, we, just, we just recently heard of just the tremendous growth that we're seeing within the fellowship with many young, young leaders emerging, Lord, in a time where um, we're not seeing that in many other uh, churches, Lord, we thank you for that. And today we want to especially lift up Dan and Jill Johnson to you and their son Luke and the rest of their family. Lord, it's hard to understand the level of grief that they must be feeling. And Lord, may you send them the peace that surpasses understanding. May you comfort them with the uh, in, impending loss of their son. May you make these final moments precious. May you free Luke from pain. And may you welcome him into your kingdom, Lord and embrace them in your loving arms. Lord, we, we lift them up to you, and we lift many others today, Lord, who are grieving, who have experienced loss. And Lord, we know that you are faithful, that you surround us, Lord, in these times of grief. And uh, Lord, so we lift these needs up to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Children, uh, up to the age of seven, you can follow the green flag and uh, go off to your class this morning, and we just trust that you have a great time studying God's Word and learning about Jesus. And if you have your Bibles with you today, I'd ask you to open to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to begin reading in verse 11 this morning. 2 Corinthians 5. 11. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Well, I, I'm sure <clears throat> any one of you who goes to major sporting events or even watches them on TV will have seen uh, what is often called super fans. You know, guys with their shirts off, bodies fully covered in paint. And when they stand together, all the letters that are painted on them spells out a word. Or people, you know, wearing wild outfits, 
with their face painted and hair colored, all just to support their team. I, uh, and often these super fans are high, you know, are high energy. They stand out from the crowd. I actually read about a fellow that's from Philadelphia. He calls himself the Philly sports guy. And he actually, he used to own a business and, and he gave it up uh, and, and made a, has made a career out of going to major sporting events, you know, painting his face. He dyes his mohawk every, every game a different color. And I know for myself, when I, I go to a game, I am often entertained and amused by the outfits and antics of these super fans, but let's, let's just be honest for a moment. I think many of us, when we, we look at them and we see their, their commitment to their team, we really question, you know, is, is that fella in his right mind? You know, we, we look at what they're wearing and we ask, you know, is, is he all there? And hey, if you're here and you get painted up for your, your favorite team, don't worry. I'm sure many things I've done in the past, people have questioned my sanity, so just you're in good company, it's okay. But we still question it, don't we? What compels a fan to go all in like that? The Apostle Paul, he was all in for Jesus. Now, it wasn't like Paul was painting his face and coloring his mohawk before he went to the local synagogue to preach. But the church in Corinth was questioning his sanity on some level. They looked at his outward appearance, and based on what they saw, they questioned if his message and ministry were really trustworthy. And, And no, it wasn't face paint that made them question if he was in his right mind. See, Paul had suffered greatly as a disciple of Christ. It, it, was, it wasn't paint they saw on his face. It was, it was his suffering they saw on his face. His, his body was, was covered in weakness. And they were questioning, if Paul is truly an, an apostle of Christ, why would he suffer so much? If his, if his ministry was really empowered by the Holy Spirit, then where was the power? Because all they could see was weakness. All I could see was a man who sacrificed his comfort, even his body, for his ministry. And his ministry took a toll on his body. All you have to do is read chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Paul had been whipped, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked because he ministered in the name of Jesus Christ. Think of it. If you, if you were hauled out of a, a Bible study one day and whipped because you were leading it, would you go back to leading Bible studies? Or, or think of this. If you were hauled out of you know, the children's wing because you teach children about Jesus or, or you show up on Friday nights to lead the youth group and you got pulled out of there and you were stoned for doing so, would you get back up and just keep doing it? Because that's what Paul was doing. Paul risked his life and suffered greatly to spread the gospel to other people. And now it's like certain people in the church were saying, the gospel Paul is preaching must be false because there's no way God would expect someone to suffer so much for the sake of others in order uh, to share the true gospel with them. However, I'm reminded of Paul's conversion. In Acts chapter 9, verse 16, Jesus said this about Paul. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And the question is, what what compelled Paul to serve others so selflessly? When you look at what he endured for the sake of others, you you do question him a bit. He's like, was he out of his mind? Or are we as believers supposed to sacrifice for the sake of others so that they may know the gospel? The question I want us to ask us this morning is, what compels a believer to serve selflessly in the ministry of the church? What compels a believer to serve selflessly in the ministry of the church? And if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you're not already there. 
Before we, we dive into this passage, let's just bow our hearts and pray. Heavenly Father, before we ever loved you, you loved us. And you sent your Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We are thankful for the life that we have been given, that we are offered through the suffering of our Lord Jesus. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts and minds by the power of your Spirit this morning so we may receive your word to us. And by hearing what you say, may we obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What compels a believer to selflessly serve in the ministry of the church? Starting in verse 11, Paul writes, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. Paul had just finished reminding the church in, in verse 10 that we will all stand before Jesus one day and have to give an account to him about what we did with the life he had given us. And it kind of makes you think when you read that. When Jesus asked me what I did with my life, what do I want my answer to be? And since Paul knows that not only will he uh, stand before Christ, but all people will stand before Jesus. He works to persuade, he works to convince others to put their faith in Jesus Christ. He urges disciples of Christ to live in obedience to Jesus. And he is using the life he has been given by Christ to disciple others. He's all in for Jesus. Paul defends his ministry and he says to the church, what we are is plain to God. He doesn't have to prove to God that he's doing the work of the Lord. God knows his heart. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. He says he hopes the church can see that he is being faithful to Jesus Christ. This, this is the ministry that God had given him. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again. We're not trying to brag about what we've done for Christ, he says, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us. We, he's saying we just simply want you to take a second look at our ministry because the evidence is all there. We, we minister with the true gospel of Jesus Christ and we want you to, to support us in our work so that, he says, you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. You know, Paul was being criticized because really he, he just suffered so greatly for the gospel. And certain people concluded that, you know, if he is weak, because all they could see is weakness, if he is weak, then his message must be weak too, which is a worldly perspective. They did not look at what was in his heart, but they, they kind of looked at the, the package in which this, this message came. And it wasn't a fl flashy, flashy package. So often we make judgments on appearance rather than hearing what's in a person's heart. And based on his appearance, people just kind of question his sanity. His ministry was not marked with prestige and power, but suffering and sacrifice, and it really just seemed irrational to people. Why would anyone give themselves so selflessly to something so unattractive as suffering for, for the sake of others? Why would you do that? Now listen to what Paul says in verse 13. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. Paul is the super fan of Jesus. He's fully dressed in weakness and in the sufferings of Christ, and people are asking, is this guy all there? Paul says, if we are crazy for serving you so selflessly, then know that we are crazy because of God. For we selflessly minister with the gospel for him. This is what he has called us to do. So if we're crazy, that's because we follow God. And then he says, if we're we in our right mind, it is for you. If we're sane, if, we're, if it's rational for serving you so selflessly, then no, we are sane because of you. We know that you need Christ. And, and if you are to be saved and learn how to follow Jesus, then the reasonable thing to do is selflessly minister to you 
with the gospel so that you might be saved, might be baptized, and discipled in the love of Christ. He's saying whether our actions are irrational or rational, we act this way because we are all in for Jesus and his church. But what compelled Paul to be all in for Jesus? What compels a believer to serve selflessly in the ministry of the church? The answer is Christ's love. Christ's love compels us to serve. Paul explains in verse 14, he says, for Christ's love compels us. Christ's love, you know, for us has power. It has the power to keep us from living uh, for ourselves It has the power to cause us to live for others. Why? He says, because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Paul is convinced as we are as Christians that Jesus is the one who died on a cross for our sins. He died for the sins, as it says, of all people. Jesus did not live for himself, for love is is not selfish. Love is not self-seeking. But instead, he lived and died for others as our substitute, the righteous for the unrighteous. He showed us the greatest of love by sacrificing himself for us and serving us selflessly. See, Jesus' ministry, when you you look at his ministry to us, it is marked with suffering and sacrifice. Now, briefly, Paul is not saying here that Jesus' death covers everyone's sins, as in, All people are automatically saved from the coming wrath of God because Jesus died. But rather, his death is sufficient to cover the sins of all people who repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. For we can only be saved through faith in Jesus by believing that he died on a cross for our sins and was raised to life on the third day. And for those who repent and believe, God counts their their old sinful self as dead. That's why Paul says, and therefore all have died. For when a person unites himself with Christ through faith, the old self is gone. Paul writes in Romans 6, 6, for we know that the old self was crucified with Jesus. Our old self has died with Christ. But if our old sinful self has died with Christ and no longer lives, who is it that now lives in us as Christians? It is Christ who now lives in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we once selfishly lived for ourselves, but now that sinful desire has been put to death, who should we now live for? Paul explains in verse 15, he says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. If we have gained life through the sacrifice of Christ, we should no longer live selfishly for ourselves, but live selflessly for Jesus Christ. Paul's point is this, the reason he selflessly serves others is because his life now belongs to Jesus, and that's how Jesus lived and ministered. We live for Christ by living for others. Christ's love for us has established the pattern of Christian ministry and service. Think of it. The good news did not come to us through selfishness but it came to us through sacrifice. Christ did not live for himself, but for others. And when, you, when you look at Christ hanging on the cross, he does not appear to be a powerful man. You see a weak man nailed to the cross, but it was through his suffering and servanthood that salvation has come. Christian ministry is to bear the marks of Jesus. The world may say we're out of our mind to walk the road that Jesus walked and serve others like him, but his road is the only road that leads to glory. For God raised Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us too with Christ as we follow him and serve others lovingly. Think of this. If Jesus lived for himself, 
we would never have known salvation. If he was selfish, he would never have left heaven. Why, why would you step down from heaven to meet us here? We are difficult people. We're sinful people. If we live for ourselves, how will others ever learn about Christ? You see, Christ's love should compel us as believers to serve selflessly in the ministry of the church, for it is by his love we are saved. We are saved by his love in order to share his love. And I know at times we fight sacrificing for others. I, I'm no different. I, I fight that myself sometimes. Especially when people are difficult. But would you ever say this? It was foolish for Christ to give his life for us on the cross. Did you ever say that? And if, if you're saved, I'm sure you would never say that because you know that your salvation came through his sacrifice. We understand the importance of sacrificing for one another. We're not out of our minds to give ourselves to the ministry of the church for it's through the ministry of the church that people are saved. It's through our ministry that people come to believe in the gospel and are discipled. Christ gave up his life for us so that we would no longer selfishly live for ourselves but instead live for him. And to live for Christ is to do the work he did. It's to serve one another as he served. It's to love one another as he loved. Christ's love compels us. Along with his love, I want to consider what else should compel us to serve. God's plan. God's plan for us should encourage us to serve. Starting in, in verse 16, look at what Paul says. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. As Christians, we aren't to look at the outward appearance of a person like the world does. We're, we're to look at, at the condition of a person's heart. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Paul became a believer. Before Paul became a believer, he, he misjudged Jesus. He, he used the world standards to judge Christ, and many people still do, and they just they fail to see him for who he is. Lord and Savior. But Paul's understanding of Christ changed, and so he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And what Paul says here is this is just an amazing gospel truth. Something supernatural takes place in anyone who repents of their sin and puts their faith in Jesus Christ. They are made a new creation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Once we were spiritually dead, but now we have been made alive in Christ. And we see the world from a different perspective. We now see it from Christ's perspective. The old you, it, you know, it's gone. It's been crucified with Christ, and the new you in Christ is here. You, you've been given a new life. You have been changed, and you are being changed. You have been transformed, and you are being transformed. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We see this at work in baptism. We witnessed it this morning. The old self, sinful self, is buried with Christ. As the believer goes under the water, the old is gone. It's, it's washed away. But just as Jesus was raised from the dead, the believer is raised with Christ as they come up out of the water in order that they may live a new life that they may live fully for Christ. See, in Christ, you are, you are a new creation. And I've witnessed this, not only in my own life, but I've, I've witnessed it in the lives of others. I, I've, I've known people prior to them accepting Christ, and I have had the privilege of seeing their lives transformed when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. They are a different person after they believe. You can see it. The old is gone, the new is here. I've witnessed it in people. I can hear it in them. They say things that only a person can say who knows, who truly knows Jesus Christ. You can't fake 
knowing Jesus. You can't. There's a difference between knowing facts about Jesus and knowing him because the living spirit of Christ dwells within you. Being a new creation as Christ is more than just about breaking bad habits and trying to do good things. See, a person can break all the bad habits they want, they can do all the good deeds they can, but without Christ, they remain dead in their sin. We can't make ourselves alive. Without the gift of the Holy Spirit, we remain separated from God. See, being a new creation in Christ means that you are forgiven of all your sin and that you have been given eternal life. You've been reconciled with God and have peace with him. Amazingly, this is not something that we can do on our own. Instead, look at what Paul says in verse 18. All this is from God. See, God makes us a new creation. God is the one who reconciled us to himself through Christ, even though God is the innocent one in the relationship, okay? For we're the ones responsible for ruining our relationship with him by our sin. We're the guilty party. We're the disobedient ones. And he, but he took it upon himself to repair our relationship with him. That's how much he loves us. And he did it through the sacrifice of Jesus. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. Did you hear that? God has given us his church. The ministry of reconciliation. As believers. Now that we have peace with God. We are expected to take up the ministry of reconciliation. That is God's plan for us, that we learn to serve selflessly in the ministry of the church. Paul writes in verse 19, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God has entrusted us, his church, with the gospel, the message of salvation. He's not given it to anyone else. If we don't minister to others with the gospels, Who's going to do it? Remember, Jesus is up in heaven. He's, he's, not, he's not down here on earth spreading the good news. But instead, when he was here, he started a ministry that was marked by selfless service. And we have been called to continue this ministry on his behalf. Jesus called 12 disciples to follow him. He said, I'm going to send you out I'm going to, so you can fish for people. He taught his 12 disciples how to make disciples. And after Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent them the Holy Spirit. And then he sent them out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. And those men, they went on to make disciples. And the disciples they made went on to make more disciples. And the disciples they made went on to make more disciples and so on and so forth until it has reached us. See, we are now called to go and make disciples. It's, it's our turn now to serve in the ministry of the church, which I know many of you are. And you do so, so others may be saved and learn how to be obedient to Jesus. Listen to what Paul says. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God's salvation plan is for us to represent Christ on earth. His church is to carry on Christ's mission. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And we are to continue to seek the lost and share Christ with them. We're to serve in the ministry of the church, baptizing believers and discipling them in the love of Christ. Paul tells the message we are to spread. He says in verse 20, this is the message, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Don't leave this world 
without being reconciled to God. I'll say this. You do not want to stand before God as his enemy. It says in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Don't, don't leave this world without putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Let today be the day of salvation. For Jesus is the only one who can reconcile you with God. He is the only one that can save you from the coming wrath of God. He is the only one that can save you from hell. He is the only one who can give you eternal life in heaven. Why? Because as Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the only one who died for our sin. He, he was without sin and served us selflessly with his life. He died as our substitute. He bore our sin on the cross. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ that we are justified, that we are declared righteous and we have peace with God. You see, unrighteous people cannot have a relationship, cannot be in a relationship with a righteous God. It, it just doesn't work. So what God did for us is take our sin and he signed it to Jesus who had no sin. And he punished him for our iniquities. He bore our, our punishment. And then through faith, we're forgiven and God applies Jesus' righteousness to us so that our relationship with a righteous God could be restored. It's God's plan that we as his church work together to share the message of reconciliation with others and make disciples who go on to make more disciples. It's God's plan that instead of living for ourselves, we live for Jesus Christ and serve as his ambassadors in this world. It's God's plan that we serve selflessly in the ministry of the church. Paul says in, to the church in chapter 6, verse 1, as fellow, God's fellow workers, then, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Paul is saying, to, don't, don't receive Christ and then just continue to live for yourself, failing to live for Jesus and participating in his work. That would be to receive God's grace in vain. We're to work at being Christ's ambassadors. We're to serve as Christ served. His love just it compels us to do so, it controls us. That's God's plan for his church. And you can trust his plan for you. I know it can be scary sometimes stepping out in faith to serve. Sometimes it can make us a little uncomfortable. I felt that in my own life. I'll tell you, majority of the time that I've taken steps of faith in service of Christ, I've been scared to do so. But what I have found out, every time I stepped out, you know who I met there? Jesus. He was right there, supporting me in the ministry. He's, he's invested himself in you, and he cares about this ministry. My encouragement to you is this. Be all in for Jesus and his church. Be all in for Jesus and his church. If you're out of your mind, then be out of your mind for Christ. The world won't understand why you serve selflessly in the ministry of the church, but it is so that people may be reconciled to God. And there is no greater calling. See, your work has eternal significance in the life of people. Keep serving. We, we are, keep serving the church. Keep serving and loving one another, for we are, we are witnessing God at work in the ministry of our church. He's working powerfully through us. It's so encouraging to be a part of it. And this is, our this is our message. We implore you on Christ's behalf.
be reconciled to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the life you have given us through the sacrifice of your son Jesus. We have gone astray and you sent him to seek and save the lost. And we ask you, Lord, that you would forgive us of our unbelief, forgive us of our idolatry. May your spirit be at work in us so that we may repent and turn to you, the living and true God. May we no longer live for ourselves, but for Jesus, who died and rose again. For in Christ we are new creations. The old is gone, the new is here. Teach us, Jesus, to serve others selflessly in the ministry of your church, just as you served. We seek to be your ambassadors. And may many come to faith and be discipled here. Jesus, we thank you for the love you have shown us. May we be obedient to your command and love one another as you have loved us. And in all of this, to God be the glory for the great things he has done. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Scott and the band forward, and let's just let's lift up our voices to the Lord and sing about our salvation. Would you stand and sing with us? The grace of God has reached for me And pulled me from the raging sea And I am saved on this solid ground, the Lord is my salvation. I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn the rising sun the Lord is my salvation let's sing who is like the Lord When I am weak, I know His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord, our God? Strong. final day you will not leave me in the grave but I will rise he will call me home the Lord is my
saved by your power and your power alone. Hallelujah, what a Savior we have. May we serve you selflessly for the rest of our days. Amen. Yeah, you guys got the drill. You, can, you may be seated. Uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, I'm doing something of an experiment. I know our classes are finished uh, for the summer, but um, I am looking to start uh, have a young adult class uh, this summer starting, I believe it's July 21st. I think there's a slide there somewhere. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. If you know anything about the Bible, Ecclesiastes is sort of like the... Uh, I grew up with emo music, right? Um, so it's kind of like that. If that reference doesn't make anything or mean anything to you, it's it's a kind of a darker book. Um, but uh, we, uh, I, if you're around this summer, we'd love to have you be part of that. We we'll just kind of use it as an excuse to kind of get together after church at 11 a.m. And um, we're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes. And if no one shows up, I will just say meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And that... <laughs> Uh, everything is meaningless. Uh, also, if you signed up uh, for the uh, book group this summer uh, and you, you checked that you wanted a, a copy of the book ordered, uh, they came in. So just go to the, the, the table outside there. You'll find your book. Just check off that you've received it so I know. And if anyone else is interested in that group, uh, the sign-up sheet is there as well. So. Next week after the service at 11 o'clock, we're going to have a prayer meeting. God is just doing so many wonderful things through our ministry, and I would just love the opportunity for us to, to gather as, as his children and just give thanks to him and just call on him to, just to work powerfully, continue to work powerfully through the ministry of our church. We've got different, I know many ministries have kind of shut down for the season, but we've got many going in the summer, and we just want to speak to the Lord about that. We have prayer books that we follow through to help our prayer time. If you've never been to these meetings before, the, the books just kind of suggest um, simple prayers for us that we can recite. It just makes it easier for us to participate. I just love our prayer time together. It's a picture of God's children sitting together, just speaking to our Heavenly Father, and I just hope that you'll be able to join us for that. If uh, after today, you just sense that God is at work in your heart and you're interested in being baptized or even would like to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ or would like to serve in the church. There are cards in the pockets uh, in the chairs in front of you. It's got a green top or it says next steps. Just fill out one of those. Check off the appropriate box. You can just take it to the drop box at the information desk. I'll get it through the week and just reach out to you. I, I'll just be honest. I just I want to help you follow Jesus. So if that's something you'd like to do, please fill that out. As you go into your week and into the world, I'm just going to send you with Romans 6, verse 8 to 14, which says, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. God bless you.